All right, here we're continuing on with section four of chapter nine, completing the square. This is a technique that you can use to convert any quadratic into a perfect square trinomial. And it's going to be useful because when you convert a quadratic function into a perfect square trinomial, then you can easily put it into vertex form, which basically allows you to find the vertex of the parabola, which then makes graphing it easy. <coughs> so it's an alternate way to find the vertex. Uh, and it's a technique that's utilized both this year and in future math classes. It keeps coming back over and over for other techniques all the way up through calculus. So <coughs> the definition is kind of vague. It just says it's a technique to rewrite a quadratic into vertex form. Now, how you actually do it is where the fun is going to begin. But first, let's remind ourselves, what is a perfect square trinomial? <coughs> perfect square trinomial is the result <coughs> when you take a binomial and you square it. So you have to have... Uh, the first term be a perfect square, the last term be a perfect square, and the middle term be exactly twice the first and second perfect squares. <clears throat> if you have something that starts off in this form, you can rewrite it as a perfect square of a binomial. Let's give two specific examples so that you can kind of remember what we did. This is all from chapter 8. The first example, x squared plus 6x plus 9. Well, 9 is certainly 3 squared x squared is obviously x squared, and the middle term here is 2 times x times 3, and so this can be rewritten as x plus 3 quantity squared. Then the next example, g to the second minus 14g plus 49. Again, 49 is 7 squared, and the middle term here is uh, the first times the last times 2, negative 14, which gives you g minus 7 squared. So anytime you have something that looks like this, a trinomial, in which the middle part is 2ab, and the first and the last pieces are perfect squares, then you can factor it, and you can write it as a perfect square. Now this is valuable because what you have here is in vertex form, and then this part inside the parentheses tells you the horizontal shift, and if there were anything outside, that would tell you the vertical shift. All right, uh, let's take a look at some problem-solving tips, and then we'll go through a derivation of how to actually complete the square. What does the technique look like? Okay, first things you need to do, factor out the a, that's the leading coefficient. So if your quadratic starts with just x squared, you don't have to do this step, but if it's like 3x squared or 5x squared or 1 half x squared or any other uh, coefficient in the front, you need to factor that out. Second thing you need to do is add and, and subtract the necessary value to complete the square. And what that is, is half the middle number squared. Let me go back one slide and show you why. The number right here is always half the middle number squared. And I'll show you that with examples um, on the previous, or sorry, on the on the next slide. Yeah. Well, if you look here, you can see it. Half of this middle number is going to be 3. 3 squared is 9. Half the middle number is 7. 7 squared is 49. Okay. And then once you've added and subtracted the necessary value, then you can distribute the a value back in if needed. I know this looks a little abstract. Please just copy it down, and when we do the examples, I promise it'll all make sense. Next, you have now a perfect square trinomial. At the end of step two, you have a, you've completed the square, so you have a perfect square. You rewrite it. Um, instead of a trinomial, you write it as a perfect square binomial. Okay, And then you might have a number left over at the back. This leftover number would go right here. And then you're done completing the square. At the end of step three, you now have a perfect square. However, a lot of times you're using this technique to then solve the problem if it's an equation, not an expression. And so if it is an equation, once you have it in this form, you can easily solve by working backwards and isolate the variable. Okay? So let's go through the process. What does it actually look like? If your leading coefficient is a 1, that means there's nothing in the front. It just starts with x squared. Okay? You have x squared plus whatever number you have here is, is usually b, right? A, a normal quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c. So whatever number is right here, you need to cut it in half and square it. So the thing that you're putting right here is half that middle number squared, which I've obviously written just as your next step. So filling in this. But if you add a certain amount to an equation, you also need to subtract that exact same amount to keep it balanced. So for example, if I add 6, I also need to subtract 6. That way, overall, my expression has the same value. Okay. Once you have done this, you can group the first three terms together, and this is a perfect square. And then whatever term is left over the back, whatever number this happens to be, it just stays as that number. Okay. And the perfect square part right here 
is now in vertex form, right? So you have an expression which is in vertex form. So the overall idea, I think, is not super complicated, but carrying it out requires you to remember that the perfect square piece you need is half the middle number. If there was any number already here that was the wrong number, you can always just push it to the back. And what, and what I mean by that, I'll show you in the examples. So this is all good and easy if the leading coefficient is just a one. Now what happens if the leading coefficient is not a one, if you have an a there? The first thing you need to do is factor the a out. If I take an a out of here, it comes to the front, now I just have x squared. If I take an a out of here, I have to divide by a, because there might not have even been an a to take out. So divide by a, and now the piece that you put here is again half the middle number. So once you factor the a out, it's still the same thing, half the middle number, which in this case is b over 2a, which is half, and then square it, and then you put the same thing right here. Again, I'm just showing what's already written down. This part inside the parentheses is your perfect square, so it becomes your perfect square. The a in the front stays as the a in the front. The trick here now that's a little bit different is whatever number you put right here, okay, it's inside parentheses that are being multiplied by an a. So if you write down like plus 5 right here, but you have a 2 in the front, the 2 gets distributed in, and that 5 that you wrote down actually has a net value of 10 because it's inside parentheses which are being doubled. So whatever number you put right here to complete the square, you have to multiply or distribute the a value in, and then that's the amount that you subtract. So I know this looks very abstract, it's got a lot of variables, but the idea is the amount that you subtract to balance it out, since it's outside the parentheses, has to be multiplied by the factor a, so that the amount that you subtract equals the amount that you added. Let's get straight to some examples where we can see what this looks like. The first ones are going to be very easy. It just says find the c-value that makes a perfect square, because if you can't get this part, you, pos you can't possibly do the rest of it. So what number would need to go here? Okay, We take half the middle number, 6 over 2, and then we square it. So this would be plus 9. We would need to add a plus 9, and of course if we add a plus 9 we also need to do, oopsie, we also need to do minus 9. So now this part is a perfect square, and this part is left over. How about this one? Half the middle number is negative 7, squared is 49, and then of course we also can do minus 49. Let's go one step farther. The part that's in parentheses here, we would now write it as x minus 7 squared minus 49. Okay, whatever piece we had, we figured out that 49 is the amount we need to add and subtract. We added it in, we complete the square. How about this one? Half the middle number is negative 5.5 or negative 11 halves. Okay, if we square that, we get 121 over 4. Square 11, you get 121. Square 2, you get 4. Square the negative sign, it goes away. Okay, and if we add it, we also have to subtract it. Very key step there. Now the part here is going to become x minus, that middle number is 11 over 2 squared minus 121 over 4. So this method works, and it probably most of the time it's going to be y equals. This method is about finding half the middle number and then squaring it. Okay, in none of these examples did we have a leading coefficient. So what happens? if you have a leading coefficient. We'll get to that next. Let's do a couple more easier examples. In these we actually have to solve the entire thing and then round to the nearest tenth place if necessary. Um, well, let's leave them as radicals. So instead of rounding to the nearest tenth, uh, we can leave in square root form. Okay, so this negative 12 right here is ask ourselves, what would we rather have? x squared plus 4x. Half the middle number here is 2 and 2 squared is 4. So instead of having a negative 12 over here, what I really would have wanted is a 4. So what I can do is I can write x squared plus 4x plus blank. Okay? Minus blank minus 12 equals 0. So I've done two things here. I've pushed the negative 12 over to the very back. I don't really want to worry about that because it's not the number that I wanted. Instead I want to look at what number should go here, and a 4 is what I said should go here. So I'm going to manually insert the 4 because that's what I needed, but if I add 4, I also have to subtract 4 to keep it balanced. Okay, 
So I've added 4, I've subtracted 4, that cancels out, so I overall have not changed the problem, and the negative 12 I've pushed to the back. Now the part in parentheses is a perfect square. It is x plus 2 squared. Okay, All this stuff left over outside the parentheses I can combine together. Negative 4 minus 12 is minus 16 equals 0. And now I've got an equation. So I took something that had variables in two places, and now I have a variable in just one place. Okay, so I can solve this. I can go plus 16, plus 16. Then I can go x plus 2 squared equals <coughs> 16. I can take the square root of both sides, and I can branch, and I can get x plus 2. The square root of 16 could be 4, or the other option, x plus 2 equals negative 4. Last step, minus 2 minus 2, x equals 2. And over here, uh, minus 2 minus 2, x equals negative 6. Okay, we got our two answers. Great. That seems like kind of a lot of work, right? And the directions so let's solve it by completing the square. And that's because they want us to practice. But I've written here a little note. It says, try factoring first, since it's easier. So for this particular problem, you could actually look at this and say, are there any two numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add to 6? And of course there are x plus 6, x minus 2. And using the zero product property, if x plus 6 is 0, then x has to equal negative 6. If x minus 2 is equal to 0, then x has to equal positive 2. And we can get this exact same answer and almost no work at all. So you can see that if the problem is factorable, then solving it by factoring is by far your option to choose. However, if this was something that we could not factor, and we're not able to come up with a possible solution by factoring, because maybe there's a radical or the answer is not going to come out nicely, then solving by completing the square is a method that will work. Right? You can see because we took the square root of 16, this gave us nice whole numbers. If this would have been a tougher number, then the answer would have come out to be radicals or fractions or decimals, and then this is the only way that we would have had available instead of using factoring. Let's try this one using the shortcut. Okay, so <clears throat> we can factor it. Two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to negative 8. That's definitely negative 3 and negative 5. So our solution is x equals 3 and x equals 5. However, the directions specifically say, and so we want to practice using this technique. So to practice using this technique, I'm going to go x squared minus 8x plus blank. And I really recommend you show the work in this way. It will lead you to a lot of success. So what number do I need to add in here to make a perfect square? Okay, I'm going to ignore the 15 because that's not the number I wanted. Half the middle number is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. So I want to do plus 16. And then I need to do minus 16 to balance it out. And this 15 is left over. I can't forget about it. It's not part of my parentheses, my perfect square, but it is still part of my problem. So I include it here. Now the part in parentheses is a perfect square of x minus 4. So we write that as x minus 4 squared. The part at the back that's left over that's not part of my perfect square is minus 1 equals 0. <laughs> Another way to interpret this, by the way, is as a vertex form. If we had y equals, right, this would be shifted to the right 4 and down 1. So this is a parabola, which is right 4 and down 1. Let me draw a little quick sketch. If I go 4 units, 1, 2, 3, 4 to the right and down 1, it's not stretched or shrunk at all, so I can draw my parabola over 1, up 1. That point is 3, and then over 1, up 1 this way. That point is 5. You can see that the two solutions, 3 and 5, make perfect sense based on where this graph is a graphed. Okay? Anyways, but if we solve it, we want to add 1 to both sides, so we get x minus 4 squared equals 1. Take the square root and branch, you get x minus 4 equals 1 and you get x minus 4 equals negative 1. If you add 4 to both sides, you get x equals 5 here, and x equals 3 here. So I've shown three different ways to visualize this problem. The first is by factoring and getting the roots. The second is by completing the square and solving for x. And the third is by graphing it. Once you have it in vertex form here, you can see where the vertex is. You can graph it, and you can see visually that the two places that it crosses are at those two roots. Now we're going to do the last two examples, and these ones have a leading coefficient. So all the ones up until this point 
while not easy, are straightforward because there's no leading coefficient. These are a little bit trickier. So we notice here there's a 2 that needs to be factored out. So I factor out the 2, leaving behind x squared plus 10x. Here I want to insert my plus a blank, minus blank, equals, and the 2 is left over on the other side. All right, looking in here, half the middle number squared. Half of 10 is 5. 5 squared is 25. The problem is normally you just put a minus 25 to balance it out, but because this 25 is inside parentheses that are being doubled, this 2 is actually technically being distributed and multiplied by the 25 here. So 2 times 25 is 50. So even though I wrote a 25, the quantity which I have actually adjusted this equation by is plus 50. So to balance it out outside of the parentheses, I need to subtract 50. Okay, so we have a 2. This is a perfect square of half the middle number, or the square root of the last number, x plus 5 squared. Now let's add 50 to both sides, and we get 48, right? Minus, uh, minus 50. To cancel it out, we want to add 50. Negative 2 plus 50 is 48. Now I need to solve for x by working backwards. So I divide by 2, divide by 2. 48 over 2 is 24. And now I have my x plus 5 squared. Now this is not a perfect square, which is important because as we saw in the other problems, we could have solved by factoring. Like if we would have added 2 to both sides and then tried to factor it, we would have been able to solve the other ones. But this one you couldn't solve by factoring because it's going to come out to be a nasty radical. So take the square root of both sides, get x plus 5 equals plus or minus the square root of 24. Now we minus 5 on both sides, and our answer is x equals negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 24. Now in the book, I think it's telling you to approximate these as a decimal value, so you can type them in your calculator. In the following chapter, we're going to learn how to simplify the square root of 24. But since we haven't learned that yet, your two options are to leave it like this, negative 5 plus or minus root 24, or to actually type in your calculator, negative 5 plus root 24, get one answer, and negative 5 minus root 24 to get the other answer. I'm going to do the last example very quickly, and then that'll be the end of this video. We need to factor out 0 0.5, leaving behind x squared. If you take a 0 0.5 out of an 8, you actually get a 16, plus blank, close parentheses, minus blank, equals negative 7. Okay, half of 16 is 8, 8 squared is 64, half of 64 is 32. Add 32 to both sides. Add 32 to both sides. We get 0 0.5. Parentheses, this part inside the parentheses is going to be x plus 8 squared equals negative 7 plus 32 is actually 25. So at first thing, that's great because it's a perfect square. But alas, we need to divide by 0 0.5. Divide by 0 0.5. Cancel, cancel. x plus 8 left over inside here squared 25 divided by 0.5. Dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2, so this is going to give you a 50. Take the square root of both sides, x plus 8 equals plus or minus square root of 50, minus 8 on both sides. Final answer, x equals negative 8 plus or minus square root of 50. Okay, I know I went pretty fast on that last example, so feel free to pause it and copy stuff down, check your steps. The moral of the story for this section is twofold. Number one, take half the middle number and square it, and that's the number you need to finish your perfect square. Then once you have your perfect square, you can rewrite it from a trinomial as a binomial. Once you have the binomial, you can just work backwards to solve for x. And then if you're having any trouble with that part, you should review section uh, 8.9 for solving these for x by working backwards. So I hope this was informative. I've got a bonus video for this section. Uh, from a previous year that goes through more or less the same ideas in a slightly different way, uh, so that will be extra helpful if you're confused at all. Alright, have a good day.